You're listening to the REI Marketing Nerds Podcast, the leading resource for real estate investors who want to dominate their market online. Dan Barrett is the founder of AdWords Nerds, a high-tech digital agency focusing exclusively on helping real estate investors like you get more leads and deals online, outsmart your competition, and live a freer, more awesome life. And now, your host, Dan Barrett. All right, everybody, this is Dan Barrett. I'm here with Frank Heron from SWF lcashbuyers.com. That is Southwest Florida cashbuyers.com, but just with the initials there. He is a real estate investor in Southwest Florida. It's been basically, by, we were just talking about this, buying this huge area like from Marco Island all the way to Sarasota. So basically, if you are anywhere near Southwest Florida, there's a chance you're going to run into Frank. So Frank, Welcome, man. Welcome to the show. Super happy to have you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. So let's um let's get started the way we typically do. Walk me through how you get started, how you got started specifically in real estate investing, because investing is kind of a weird part of the world, right? So what what was your in to this whole industry that we're both a part of? So back in 2001, I had a bunch of buddies that were doing this business and I was dying to get into it, probably like a lot of people are now. And uh, they were flipping. I mean, they were flipping 20, 30 houses a month. And I was like, guys, just let me get in. Just let me get in. Just let me get in. And they, you know, they got me in. Uh, they taught me the business. And then uh, I flipped my first house down in Fort Lauderdale, probably 2002. And I made 7,000 bucks. And I thought I was a millionaire. <laughs> uh, although 7,000 was a lot more in 2001 than it is now. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then I think I took that money. I parlayed it into two other, you know, we're talking like forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 purchase price deals. I had them with a hard money lender. And then I just grew that into like six months later, doing like seven to 10 houses a month. Wow. Because back then our, our primary area in Fort Lauderdale was just this little area with cheap houses where you would get them for 40 and you're flipping them for like 100, 110. Wow. Bread and butter down there. So I'm assuming that, that that went through a pretty significant change around 2008, right? Because you're saying 2001 is when you got started. Yeah. So I did that for about five years. And then I started flipping a lot of houses. I, you know, my motto was like, why should I flip small 10, 10 small deals when I can flip one big deal in right. like the Oakland Park, Wilton Manors area? So then I just started doing like one or two a month uh, high end properties where we were pulling out a ton of money. And then, of course, uh, I mean, I seen the market changing around 06, 07, when we were trying to flip these houses to people and they couldn't qualify and they did away with the, you know, no, no stated, no doc income loans. I was like, oh boy, you know, right. and then it just went downhill quickly. And thank God I didn't have a lot of property. So I kind of so made it you, out. Did, did you, I, so it's interesting, right? Because I talked to a lot of people who went through that time, right? It seemed like your your spidey sense went off. You could sort of tell something was happening. So did you, did you consciously diminish the amount of like properties you had and like risk that you had? Or was it was it just kind of, you know, did you see that coming or was it more just kind of luck where you're like, oh? Well, I see it coming because if you can't move your properties, I mean, <laughs> you know, you're in big trouble. I mean, buying them is one thing, but getting rid of them is another. And we were just having a real problem getting people financed. So we just stopped buying altogether. Right. Yeah, yeah. And stop buying, stop flipping, whatever. We weren't wholesaling back then, of course. It was just purchasing and uh, I mean, it went downhill quick. Yeah, that's wild, man. So, we'll, I mean, so walk me through that time because I mean, I don't know. Sometimes people don't want don't like to talk about it. I think we everybody has a little bit of PTSD from it. But yeah. what was it like? What was it like getting out of that and sort of getting back to normal? Because we can flash forward a little bit. I mean, you are a very successful investor. You're investing all over Southwest Florida. We were talking about this before. You you do every kind of possible type of deal type. You have been there and done that, right? So, what was the process like going from what you had done to that kind of post 2008 landscape? Well, when it started going down, I mean, we were, of course, everybody was doing, if you were active in the market back then, I mean, you could just fall into 30, 40, $50,000 profits. Yeah. So I took a lot of that money and I bought some, uh, some small businesses, cash businesses. So thank God that got me through the rough period, but getting out of the market, I mean, it was hard. There was a lot of upset people, you know, we were holding some houses for people so many people were going bankrupt and including those properties in their bankruptcy. And uh, again, I didn't have any properties in my name back then, but we were managing a lot of properties, kind of doing the property management for people. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, it just, it just got pretty, pretty ugly. 
you know, of course, when you're when you were making money for people back then, they loved you to death. Right. But they actually thought 07 was my fault. You know, like I controlled the market or something. Right. You know, I owned two businesses. I owned a juice bar and a tanning salon. You know, I was doing very well at those, even even in the recession period. And then in 08, I had somebody come to me and I started the medical business, which I ran that medical business for about 10 years. And I was very successful at that. And then in 2012, somebody started talking to me about wholesaling and short sales. I was like, come on, man, that doesn't work. (laughs) <laughs> Actually, that might have been like 10, 11, because I think I got back into it 11 or 12, right around there. Right. And I've been doing it since. And all the way up to my first deal, which I believe was an 11, I'm talking about my first wholesale deal. My wife did not believe that wholesaling worked. Right. She said, why would somebody sell you a house at this and you'd be able to turn around and do this and that? And I remember standing next to Sean Terry out at one of his events in 2012. I'm like, Sean, I just got my first deal, man. It's like a $27,000 deal. And uh, it's quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I it's funny because I also, I mean, when I got my first client that was wholesaling as a, you know, I was an online marketer, just kind of working with whoever, the first investor that I worked with, I had the exact same reaction where I was like, this is totally a scam. I don't understand. It doesn't work. No way. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So I want to ask about this. So you, it, I, I mean, this this strikes me as like something really amazing, right? Where you 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 felt, kind of cash tightening. You bought these other cash businesses, right? The juice bar, the tanning salon, the medical business. So I'm really curious, like you are pretty unique, I think, uh, among a lot of investors in that you've been successful in a lot of very different business types, right? So I'm really curious about why do you think that is? Like, what is it about your, you know, approach or your personality or what is it that allows you to kind of jump from these very different businesses and have a lot of success? Number one, I'm sure everybody knows about the four different personalities. I mean, I am red to red. I mean, just 100% mm. red. I bought into uh, a home investors. You know, we buy ugly houses in 2012. And I was so red, I didn't even think they were going to let me join into the business because <laughs> it was down to the point where like, I wanted to change the rules and why are you guys doing this? And, you know, right. they're a very successful business, of course. Yeah, yeah. But I swear, I was so red, I didn't know if they were going to let me uh, join, you know? Right. And I wanted to join them because, of course, I thought they were going to give me all the leads. Right. So, okay, so why why do I think I'm successful in businesses? I think I have good foresight. I think I can see what's coming down the road, you know, and I, I, I kind of think we're getting to that point again. A lot of people that are just getting into the market tell me I'm nuts. There's no way market's on fire. There's no way it could go down. And I'm just sitting back going, I'm telling you, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. So, uh, yeah. Well, it's funny, man. Like I, I, uh, I am in a mastermind with a lot of investors. And t- to me, the, the pattern that I noticed was the longer the person had been an investor, right? So the, the longer that they had had success, the longer they'd been in the market, the more that they were concerned, this was last year, about a market correction this year and the next year, right? So I was like, oh, that's a very like noticeable pattern. The more experience someone has, you know, and I don't even want to say like the more concerned they were about it. It's just the more that they realize that that's a possibility. And I think a lot of people, if if all they've known is a certain kind of market, it's kind of hard to imagine how quickly that can change. That's my point exactly. They tell me like, you know, like, how can it go down? How this? I'm just like, well, first of all, it's supply and demand. I mean, you need to keep having buyers at these prices. And these prices are so outrageous now. I mean, and it's, I'm, in a, I'm not in a good market. I mean, Naples, there's zero distress over here. It seems like everybody's rich. And I don't even really do proper. I don't even purchase properties. And I'm doing like seven a month now, maybe eight a month. I'd say I get one every two or three months in Naples. Most of my business is from Fort Myers to... Sarasota, Manatee County. And um, I don't know, we're just so topped out and new construction because there's tons of land over here on the yeah. on the West Coast of Florida, but new construction is hampering how high the flips can go. So, I mean, you're, you're buying properties, say three years ago, just for a little bit less than you're buying them now, but they can't go any higher because why would someone pay 200 grand for just say a house in Lehigh Acres over here when for 220 they can get a brand new, gorgeous new construction. 
you know? Right. You know, it, it strikes me as there's this like repeated pattern that humans go through where they underestimate the probability of something unexpected happen, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like the thing that got pointed out to me and I was like, wow, it's really true is like, if you look back in history, it's like every worst, like every worst earthquake in history, like the worst tornado in history, the worst tsunami, like whatever, the, the most destructive event. Before that event happened, nothing like that had ever happened. And yeah. so people would look back and say, well, we're never going to get a tornado this strong because that's never happened in the history of humanity, right? And I'm like, but there's always a first time for everything, right? Yeah. So it's any specific thing might not be likely, but something is likely. And so this whole question of like, well, how could it possibly happen? I'm like, I don't know. It, just the fact that maybe it hasn't happened in the past doesn't mean it can't happen in the future. We fall into that trap a lot. You know what I mean? I think that's the very natural thing for people to do if they, they just haven't thought it through very much. Yeah. I'll tell you, the first time again in 06, 07, I had buddies putting... Um, so a big thing down in Miami was flipping condos, right? Yeah. So you were taking your 10, 20% down and putting it on a condo. And then two years by the time it was ready, you were making 100, 200, $300,000 profit. Right. I had a good buddy that was taking all this money and putting it in condos. And I was like, I'm not going to say names, but I was like, man, do you realize that condos are not moving right now? Like, because so many people did that three years ago. Right. Now there's just thousands and thousands and thousands of condos mm. on the market. And sure enough, I have a buddy that lost probably 500,000 on condos. And I mean, hard, cold cash, you know, what I mean? and that's just one buddy. I mean, yeah. and it's kind of going, I think it's kind of happening again in Miami and that really bring the market uh, down there. Yeah. Want to find motivated seller leads online, but don't know where to start? Download our free 2019 motivated seller keyword report today. AdWords nerds have spent over $5 million this year researching the most profitable keywords for finding motivated seller leads. And you can grab these exact keywords when you download our report at www.adwordsnerds.com slash keywords. Well, let me, so let me ask you, so, and I'm really interested about, I'm always fascinated by people. I, I live in a world like the online marketing world, right? There's a lot of coaches out there. And one of the things that you learn very quickly is that like a lot of the people who want to teach marketing or whatever, they've never done it, right? <laughs> they've only, they, they learned it and now they teach it and they make their money from teaching it, but they never actually made any money from actually doing, right? But I'm always fascinated by people who have a repeated track record of success. And now, so now you were, you were successful in real estate, successful in you know, like the juice business, right? It's successful in all these different businesses, successful again in a very different real estate market. I'm yeah. curious, like, you know, and it sounds like maybe the medical business was the one you ran the longest. What did you learn from those other businesses that you now think about or apply inside your real estate? Uh, I don't know, it's kind of tough. It's a tough one. It's a stumper. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I, I think I just have good foresight and I try to be, you know, as you get older, I mean, when you're in your 20s, you're just reckless. And as you get 30s and get married and have kids, I mean, your whole world changes. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I live a great lifestyle now, but I've definitely gotten more conservative as I've gotten older, I'm not just a knucklehead. I mean, I honestly can't wait for the market to correct and go down because the knowledge I've gained over the last seven years, I mean, I just can't wait to be buying properties for 20 and 30 cents on the dollar when the market goes down and tanks, you know? I don't ever think it's going to tank like it did. But I mean, it's definitely going to correct. And who knows what it is, 10, 20, 30, 40%. We don't know, you know? Yeah. Well, it's the whole thing, right? It's buy low, sell high. That's the whole idea. And I think if you can have money ready to go, that's the person that makes all the money in the correction, right? The person that's got money out of the market that they can put in the market at the right time. If you're super over leveraged and the market goes down, well, you're one of the ones that people profit off of. Right, which is yeah. There's so a lot of people call me and want me to be, you know, train them and you know all these different things and ask me questions. I said, listen, man, it comes down to buy cheap and sell high. That's <laughs> what it is. Well, man. it's easy when you say that, but uh, yeah. yeah, but it's but, but that's what it really all comes down to. <laughs> I know. 
I mean, so let's let's talk about how you run your real estate investing business today. We were talking about this before, before we jumped on, before we started recording. And again, I, I highly recommend if, if you're listening to this, you're an investor, and definitely if you're a seller, but you know, if you're an investor, go check out Frank's website. It's at swflcashbuyers.com. So swflcashbuyers.com. And we were talking about you have this like little cartoon caricature of yourself, which is really cool looking and it's like neat. And I was saying like, it, it really gives a lot of personality to the site where I think a lot of investor sites have almost no personality. And we started get, talking about marketing and you were saying, you know, like you think of yourself as a marketer first. So can you talk to me a little bit about that? Like when you say that, like, what do you mean? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, if, if you're a wholesaler, because not, not a lot of rehabbers market for property. They pretty much buy them all off wholesalers. So if you're a wholesaler, you need to, of course, set yourself apart. Like you said, if you Google right now, I mean, 9 million people have, what is that called? Uh, Investor carrot. And yep. they all look pretty much the same. So you got to kind of set yourself apart, you know? And then, you know, on all my mail and all my postcards, I was doing more of the corporate look, like the picture you had said. Yeah. But a lot of people think you're a realtor. And so I started putting myself on that cartoon. I started putting that on my mail now and on all my marketing. And I think it just sets me apart a little bit. So, I mean, you got to be good at marketing to set yourself apart to get these deals because they're so hard to get by. Well, and I love the little note that you just said about you don't want to look like a realtor. I never really even thought about that, but that's super true, right? Well, it depends how you market yourself because a lot of people now in competitive cities, like just say Miami, they're not even marketing themselves as the buyer. They're marketing themselves as they'll bring you a buyer. You know what I'm saying? So it's okay to look like a realtor if you want to do that. But I'm representing myself as the cash buyer. And I, I, I don't know. I just like the cartoon look a little more now. Yeah. Well, it also gives you like a really strong visual anchor. And, you know, I think a lot of it is just who comes to mind. When you get into the situation where you need to sell, you are motivated to sell, right? What, who comes to mind in that instance? And I think that the cartoon does a great job of kind of anchoring it. And again, if you guys, if you guys are listening to this, I highly suggest you go check it out so you can see what we're talking about at swflcashbuyers.com. You can see it like it's kind of in the lower right hand corner as I'm looking at it, but it'll be somewhere on the page. So talk to me a little bit about, you've been in this game a long time. Obviously the marketing game has changed a lot. So like, what have you noticed in terms of like, what kind of marketing is working for you? And we don't have to talk about specifics, but I'm talking about more like the approach and like kind of what you think about when you're putting together a marketing. Well, I mean, you know, when I started in 2012, I mostly did, uh, I guess, SEO, which was very easy back then because there wasn't a lot of competition. PPC was extremely easy. I couldn't even spend my budget if I wanted to. Right. And my budget was like, you know, like back then, maybe 150 a day. Couldn't spend it if I wanted to. You yeah. Know? And yeah. now, you know, and of course, mail was pretty responsive. I guess back then, even though it sounds horrible, it was a 1% response rate. Now I'm up to 50,000 pieces of mail. And I probably get like a 0.4 or 0.5 response rate, yeah. which is horrible. But you just have to send so much mail to get the same amount of leads. Yeah, My budget now on, on PPC is probably 350 a day. I've actually stopped that this month because yeah. I just feel like the only people clicking on ads now are other people clicking on your ads to see what you're doing because they're not getting the, the leads we used to get, you know? Right. Yeah, And then as far as SEO, I mean, that's become, I think the experts in this business, they realize that SEO is where the money's at right now. Yeah, Because a lot of people, especially your serious sellers, your probate people, I don't mean your person that's falling behind a mortgage and their house is going up for auction, you know, in two days. I mean, the, you know, people are doing research now. And if you're doing your job on SEO, I think it's a great way to get get leads now. I'm actually signed up with you guys on SEO with Patty. Yeah. And I think, again, that's another reason for people to check out the site. I think you do a good job of providing resources to educate the seller. But I do think that there is a noticeable difference there between in lead quality between the person that's spending a little bit more time on the site, they're reading a little bit more, they're they're looking into things versus the person that's just clicking the ad and filling out as many forms as humanly possible because the mob's coming to their house tomorrow, they're going to kill them and they need to sell it. You know what I mean? It's so competitive now that I mean, those aren't even the good leads anymore, to be honest. Yeah. Because there's always a rookie or two in there that will 
go way over what they're supposed to be spending on it. And it just, it just gets out of control really. Yeah. I think it, we're, we're definitely in a market where the, the forms of online marketing are getting significantly more competitive. And so, you know, for me, it's really become an, an issue where it's not that obviously I still believe in online marketing. It's all I do every day. Right. So it's, I, I know that it works, but it's much more, Hey, we're going to do five different things. You know, have five different channels and we're splitting our budget among them because no one thing is going to be the big thing that's going to bring us everything that we need, yeah. right? We really have to be diversified. And I think, I think you've done a really good job on that. I do think um, SEO is, you know, I said this this year and I, I think it's going to be even more true next year. I think investors have really ignored SEO and done a lot of really low quality SEO because, hey, I could throw a hundred bucks at it and hey, that'll be fine. And I just don't think that's going to cut it at all. And yeah. you know, the kind of marketing that we're getting in, getting into where kind of market we're getting into where the margin is so critical and the ROI is so critical, SEO is just going to play a bigger and bigger part in that world. I think so. Yeah, I think you're you're basically you know five or six months ahead of everybody else, which is pretty sweet. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, SEO in this year, I mean, I probably have. Two fifty thousand dollar deals, probably two or three forty thousand dollar deals, and a bunch of you know, <laughs> a bunch of real good ones in there. Um, you know the PP the PPC ones. It's just like I said, it seems like they're getting smaller and smaller yeah. because they fill out five or six different forms. You know. Yeah, and I think it's certainly true. And I, you know, everybody knows this, but it's like obviously it's market dependent and all that stuff. But yeah, I no, think absolutely. it's yeah. I think I think. We're saying it right now. I'm going on the record. 2020 is the year of SEO for for real estate investing. You said it. I said it. We're official. You want to be on my 2020 SEO committee? I'm putting you on. Yeah, man. I'll keep track of all the deals I get on SEO. All right. Perfect. From you guys, actually. (laughs) Yeah, I am. Beautiful. So... All right, man. So, I mean, I, I don't want to, I, I kind of want to keep talking to you, but I don't want to keep you super long. One of the things I wanted to ask is, you know, this is what everybody's going to wonder. And I know, I know you get this question all the time, right? If you're a real estate investor that doesn't have the experience that you've had, you've been through the ringer, like you're saying, we've done like every possible deal type. If you're, a, you know, kind of a newer investor starting right now, you're listening to this podcast, you're listening to you talk about like, hey, like, you know, there's market correction coming. If you were in that person's shoes, what would you do? And you can be as general or specific as you want. But what what would, what should that investor be thinking about if they haven't had this experience of going through these kind of tighter times before? Well, I mean, there's a couple tips I can give on how to be, I, I would say, a better, um, I don't know, I'm not going to say salesperson, I guess, better investor, wholesaler, whatever. Sure. Number one, I mean, to me, 90% of the money is in the follow-up. Yeah. I mean, I consider myself, my wife calls me a grinder. Other people call me tenacious. Other people call me annoying. You know, if you're not following up in this market, I guarantee I'm taking your deal because I mean, I go from, I guess, daily to every other day to weekly to monthly sending the mail. You know, a lot of people will get the lead and it's not a right now deal. Oh, I'm going to sell in January. Well, guess what? I'm calling them in December. I'm sending the mail in December. I have a real nice uh, brochure I send them with all my mail about my title company, my Better Business Bureau, and about me team, you know, me, my wife, everybody that's on my team. So they have that there. And when they're ready to sell in January, if I can't get them, trust me, they're calling me. So a lot of people I think aren't following up. And as the, the market is so, so uh, you know, so tight, you have to follow up with these people. A lot of people, yeah. I've been in sales my whole life. A lot of people are, are scared to hear the no, I don't want to sell right now, you know? So yeah, I'm a hundred percent on board with you. And I would even go so far as to say people who think they're following up probably aren't following up nearly enough. (laughs) That's what I mean. Like I go from daily to every other day, you know, as we go further back to monthly to, you know, I got drip campaigns through all these podio investor views. I got my own drip campaign. I did if they come into PPC or SEO and an email I'm sorry, a, uh, a video five minutes after, then it goes to the next morning, then the two days later, then three days later, and it just keeps going. And then you just got to stay in their head. I love it, man. I think that is, that's such a critical piece of advice and I'm a hundred percent with you. And, uh, 
Yeah, man. I th- I'm actually just going to leave it there because I- I'm sure you could keep going, but like that's such an important piece of advice that I kind of just want to leave it because I don't want to distract from it. And I just feel like just just like you said, man, it's like, hey, you're already generating leads. You're spending money on the marketing. If you can just close a couple extra percentage points of deals, I mean, it would just change your business, right? So I think that's... Yeah. A lot of the good guys say that. You don't need more leads. You need to convert the leads you're getting. Yes. You need to dig into yes. those more and follow up more. And that's, that's where it's at. Well, Frank, I know your last name is Heron, but... Yes. Today you are my hero. And no, all right. That was pretty bad. But you know, if everybody's listening to this, is there anywhere like you want people to catch up with you online? Like do you do, you do like Facebook or Instagram or anything like that? Yeah, I mean my, my Facebook is uh, you know, the slash and then my real options. Okay. Twitter is Frank J. Heron. All right, cool. At Frank J. Heron, whatever. And then um, what else? I don't really use a lot of social media. I'm kind of an old school guy. I mean, I go like put stuff on there like once a month. I also do the Instagram. I put some of my deals on there. As I'm leaving, I'll you know I'll put a little teaser ad on there. It's something. All right, cool. Are you? Uh, let's see. I think I got. I think. Well, no. This is a different Frank Heron on Instagram. I think. No, it's real. I only do the business. It's real options. Oh, okay. Real options investments dot LLC. All right, cool. So real for people that are listening to this, oh yeah, I got you right there. Dot LLC. Okay, cool. The. Uh, yeah, there because there's a some other surly guy named Frank Heron Jr. That's not you. So what I'm going to do is uh, people can go to adwordsnurse.com slash podcast. You can find this episode with Frank. I'm going to have all the links to Frank's website, which is, again, is swflcashbuyers.com. We'll have the links to the Facebook, which is uh, facebook.com slash myrealoptions. The Twitter, twitter.com slash Frank J. Heron. And of course, we'll do the Instagram as well. Which is Instagram.com real options investments. Yo, Frank, this was amazing, man. Thank you so much for this conversation. I really appreciate it. And uh, I gotta say, I just really appreciate your take on this because you've had you've like us, I mean you've been through it all. And uh, yeah, I, I really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right, cheers everybody. Thanks. All right, take care. This is the podcastfactory.com.